This is Start, Grow, Manage, where we help managed service providers achieve the impact, freedom, and wealth you imagined back when you started your company. At Start, Grow, Manage, our tools, practices, and processes help you engage, energize, and execute on building a business that empowers an extraordinary life. Learn more about our programs and how they can fuel your fire at startgrowmanage.com slash learn more. Let's go. All right, Joe, how's it going? Going good, man. How are you doing today? Good. You've got a trip scheduled for this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be heading out, man. That's exciting. Are, are you leaving from Austin? I am leaving from Austin, heading back. Did you know that, that Austin has the highest incidence of near misses in the U.S. by, by a huge margin? I did not know that. Yeah, I really needed to know that. Before. It, 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 <laughs> a very dangerous airport because... Because I don't know, for whatever reason, planes keep almost crashing into each other or something to do with the design. And so good luck, man. I'm what I like is that they don't have the highest uh, thing of incidents. They have the highest thing of near incidents, which is better than the, the highest thing of incidents. And, right? until, <laughs> until the near misses become, <laughs> become hits, my friend. Uh, right? Well, like, I just have to now go Google to see who has the highest number of actual incidents versus near misses? <laughs> well, it's been a long time since there's been a crash at an airport. So, you yeah. know, wow, Austin apparently is top of the list. So I'm I'm rooting for you, man. I'm rooting for you. <laughs> I hope you make it back and work forward to seeing you in New York. What would be interesting is to know what the incident rate is at LaGuardia, because I'm sure it's not zero. <laughs> So, so come into JFK, so we're good. <laughs> so, so on, what we really want to talk about today is content. And there's this idea that content somehow has something to do with the internet, blogs, and now we've got content marketing and, mm -hmm. and all of these things, which I, don't, I think is great fun, you know, but there's this misnomer that that is the origin of content the content new content is new yeah the content is new that all of a sudden i need content and and this, this is, what's changed is now that anybody can put content out there it used to be a lot yeah. harder to get content out there but you've always needed content for your sales and marketing yeah i imagine yeah. That you go to a sales meeting in 1989. Well, listen, listen. Look, back in, in 2004, when I had my office, I, I managed to get my hands on of old brochures from like the 60s and 70s from IBM and from all the Wang and all that yeah. stuff. And I had a sure. frame and it was like this. Sales? Yeah. You, you go to a sales meeting and and you are going to have to bring content. And one of the books I found, this is a book that I've had on my shelf for a long time. So On Strategy by the Boston Consulting Group. And one of the founders of, the, of BCG is Bruce Henderson. He used to write these long-winded newsletters and conversations. You see one of the things that he has here is the four quadrants with the dogs and the stars, and, and he develops all that here. I mean, th this is decades ago, guys. I'm not even sure when he wrote this, but this is decades ago that, that he's writing this. So this was in 1980. He's writing this. This is well before we're putting things on the internet. He's yeah. coming up with these strategic models, and you have to write them down. And it's that content that drives the conversation. You don't always have to write it down. It doesn't have to be in a book, right? But people have always had to have something to say. So, so this is really not new. And, and if you don't know what your content, if you have no content, you're going to really struggle to sell. You, know? yeah. you have yeah. nothing to say that's relevant to the person who's buying. You're going to struggle to sell. But that's the, the, you said the magic word, right? Because the other thing that I see a lot now is irrelevant content. It's irrelevant content. Right? Yeah. So you could fire hose the crap out of somebody with content that's not relevant to them, and you're still not going to sell. And so, 
I, I think this is the thing that actually has changed because I think there was a time when you could just do any old stuff. Well, there wasn't a way to fire hose. You couldn't afford yeah. fire hose. The channels to market were so expensive. Yeah. There's no way for you to get that content out there. But now the channels are cheap. So there's plenty of content, lots of content. And and the question is, how do you stand out? And you don't stand out by being bland and boring and having the same thing as everybody else and being irrelevant and being generic. You have to stand out with stuff that is relevant to the reader. And it's that relevance that continues to increase. And I honestly think this is going to be one of the biggest changes with AI. I'm not worried about AI generating content because it's generally- Not that good. In my, in my estimation, it's not very good content. But, but what I think it will be doing is actually helping us cut through all the garbage and get to stuff that's more relevant to us. So I, I kind of suspect human beings are going to be doing the creating and the development for quite a while, but the AI is going to help cut through the crap. And so you're going to have to be a lot more intelligent in terms of getting the right content in front of the right audience. So I think that's important. And then the other thing that's crucial, one of your favorite sayings, right, is that uh, what is it? The money is in the follow-up? The fortune is in the follow-up. Follow of course, <laughs> literally, how can I miss that? The fortune's in the follow-up, right? And follow-up, again, requires content. Content, that nurturing content. We tend to think that it's going out and asking people for the sale, for the sale, for the sale, for the sale. That's it. But you you want to nurture them, keep them around, let them know what you're doing. I mean, that that's... A lot of what was going on here was actually nurturing the consultants as much as anybody to keep them yeah. engaged. But it's so interesting. If you go to anybody and you start selling to anybody, so there's sort of 3% of the market that's ready to buy you know, right now. And, and that's an estimation. I can't remember exactly where that came from, but there are a lot of these estimates and they come sort of in that 2 to 3%, which I think is high. I think somebody's actually making these statistics look better than they are. Uh, but then there's the other side of it, which means that there's a, there's probably 30% that are never going to buy. Of your ideal target market, problem aware, they know they need it, 3% are going to buy now, 30% are never going to buy. So the difference is, right, 67%. If you don't follow up with some of that nurture content, if you don't follow up with that content, then you are ignoring 67% of your potential sales. And that's huge. Yeah. And, and as somebody who's been selling for over three decades, right? I can't tell you how many times this happened that I've sent somebody a tool. I've sent somebody something interesting that they're interested in. Some something, some article, some tool, some card, a book. Right. And that's the thing that gets them to call me back and leads to a closed sale. Yeah. Right? Because it's relevant to them. And when they get it, they're like, oh, you know, hey, Joe, thanks for this thing. Oh, great. Let's chat. Where are you? Where are you with this, you know, with this problem that I solved for you? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, oh, well, now that we're talking, this is where I am. And then that leads mm -hmm. to the conversation. So it's that nurture that, that you, you want access to the fortune. You have to follow up. You have to follow up with relevant content that makes a difference in what they are up to in their life and in their business. Which, you know, brings us back to the dating analogy where people say that, that, that sales is like dating. And, and one of the things that we keep saying yeah. is it's not like dating. It is. It is dating. So, I mean, it's the same thing. There's actually no difference. You know, how do you get to know somebody in a dating relationship? It's with content. You talk to each other. You have conversations over dinner. 100%. It's the same thing in, you know, business. The, the challenge is we tend to take all that. We want to automate it, put money into marketing. Look, that's a different conversation, the automation of it. But content is something that you are going to really have to understand in order to make to make your business work. Well, um, one of the things that I like that you say all the time is 
<laughs> figure out what it is first, and then you can automate it. Because yeah, we all have this kind of, passion yeah. for automating stuff that we don't even know what it is. You can't automate a process if you don't know what the process is, because you're just going to get you're just going to get garbage out of it, right? Yeah. And one of the things that we find is people spending so much money on marketing on getting that content out there. And I always say, you know, you shouldn't be marketing if your MSP is less than $2 million. And that's actually the MSP of any business at the end of the day. Like marketing in the sense of spending money on bringing in leads. I think there's an exception to that. And, and I think the exception to that is SEO and, and creating content that search engines can find for you. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect to get results right away. So you don't write an article today and then get a result tomorrow. But I, I do find that SEO has a couple of benefits. And that is when you're writing content and you start to get feedback as to the relevance of that content, then Google is going to give you that feedback. You know, So you start to get feedback as to the relevance and see who else is talking about these topics. And that gives you some insight that, you know, right away. But it also helps establish you as a thought leader, as somebody with ideas. And even though you might not get a lot of traffic today, you will eventually get traffic if you keep developing that SEO program, if you keep putting content on your website, eventually that becomes an engine. And that's something you've got to start very early. So I think grabbing content, making sure that it's relevant to your customer, putting it on your website, and then just looking to see how relevant that is, what Google's doing with that content. Uh, e even if you're not getting a lot of responses from it at first, it's going to help you understand what's relevant and what's not relevant and what you're up against. Mm. Um, that's kind of my exception to the, to the no marketing rule. So it's not really what well, people like, think of when you go to marketing, really. Is it, you know, yeah, it really, because what you said that's really important about that is that it's a long game, right? And so SEO, as, yo, SEO is really about building your reputation such that you are known for that thing. Yeah. Right? You're known for that thing. And how you get known for that thing is it's that drip of content that you're always putting out there that always reinforces who you are. Yeah. In the Which world. Which us back to, like, that's how the Boston Strategy Group made themselves famous. Content, content, content. You know, that's how McKinsey does it. Content, content, content. If you want to change the world, if you want to make yourself known, you do it through content. Awesome. Awesome. So we have a, a nice conversation lined up today with Devin Rose. Now, he focuses on marketing for MSPs, data centers, vendors, and, and others in the tech space. And while I say don't spend money on marketing, I, I do think that Devin has a, a very measured approach. He, he, he really understands that, that thing around not wasting money. He's got this beautiful graphic that we'll put a link to uh, and that we talk about in the conversation around where to spend your money. And, and at the beginning, he's just talking about content creation. And then once you've got that solid, then you can go into advertising and and growing and, and doing other things, but really starting with content creation. So I love that, that approach. And I think he's got some really good ideas around how to market your MSP, how marketing for MSPs works. And really, he's had a lot of success marketing all of these types of businesses, especially IT service providers, where he's worked with hundreds, hundreds of them over 10 years. And, and one of the things that he talks about is, is that there's uh, usually some pretty good ways to so some pretty fundamental things that people are doing wrong that you can fix pretty quickly in, in order to make your your website work better for you, your marketing as it is work better for you, and your content work better for you. So uh, let's go have a conversation with Devin. How's that sound? Pretty cool. Let's do it. All righty. Hey, Devin, welcome to the Start Grow Manage podcast. It is a pleasure to meet you. We talked to Heartland a while back and we, we talked then about how to not sell your company for $14,000, which, which was Joe's experience <laughs> selling his first MSP. Did, you didn't sell, you, you got, you sold it for more, but you had debt. I sold it for a lot more, but at, after I paid all the debt and he ended up and with I, accumulated, I ended up with 14K. So, so a nice dinner in New York City. 
So anyway, we started talking about marketing and some of the issues of marketing because that's key to actually creating a scalable, sellable MSP. And that quickly led to the conversation with you, Devin. So we've been looking forward to having this conversation, learning a little bit about how you market, what is key for, for MSPs. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I'm really excited to be on today. I really enjoy the pod and I'm glad I could hop on for an episode here. Nice. So what's so uh, how's it going in your world? Good. We're, we're very busy. It's an interesting time for MSPs. There's a lot of change in the world with how MSPs need to represent themselves. There's more competition than ever. All the changing industry factors are keeping us busy and keeping us on our toes. So what do you see changing there? That's particularly interesting. I'd love to know what you see. So I think one of the biggest things that we're seeing is there's obviously it's a story that's been a few years in the making here at least, but just the increasing role of ransomware and how that is such a big factor for MSPs. It's not really our space, but you even hear that in, on the insurance side of things, right? It's becoming harder and harder to get an insur- a cyber security insurance and more costly. So that is a, a big factor for MSPs and seeing consolidation and kind of the, the smaller MSPs is kind of struggling to, to keep up. And another interesting thing with ransomware from the marketing perspective, it's a tricky one because on one hand, ransomware is an emotionally compelling thing, right? It's MSPs sometimes struggle putting a foot forward that is super uh, compelling. And ransomware is that because you can tell the story of a a business that has gone under because of a ransomware event. But on the other side of it is you don't want to lean too much into the fear mongering with your marketing. So it's hard to strike that balance. So that's one thing that we're seeing is how to uh, position the company on the ransomware side of things. Cool. So what do you think is essential for those MSPs who want to stand out. So they're in this ransomware, cybersecurity disaster, the world is coming to an end, but everybody is, right? Right. So how do you separate one from another? I think it's industry specific to an extent as well. You know, I was listening to some of the earlier pods you guys have done and you you fit on this notion of having an avatar And so I I think that is a a really interesting point and to have a a target decision maker in mind and have a target industry in mind. So, I mean, let's say if you're in an industry where compliance is a big part of it, like leaning into that and when you're talking about ransomware and like how meeting the clients um, requirements will help to mitigate a lot of the ransomware issues. But maybe if you're more a general small business trying to get across to the, to the client, what's the cost of the downtime? And also, what's the impact to your brand? Because like these events are can be pretty catastrophic for the clients of MSPs. And that's when you're going to start getting things like bad Google reviews. It's going to hurt your ability to generate referrals and the strength of your word of mouth marketing, which is obviously such a big factor for MSPs. So yeah, I think it depends a little bit on the industry and the persona you're trying to reach. But yeah, definitely want to keep it top of mind. And just also making sure that your security posture is coming across with your marketing and make sure your website is is touching on how you would approach a ransomware event and how you go about uh, mitigating them as well. Yeah, it was interesting. You talk about like the industry specific of it. I was having a conversation this morning with someone, you know, focusing MSP, bringing in the idea of cybersecurity. It's got a really great solution around integrating and protecting endpoints for medical clinics. And it is interesting when the point that you make is when you go out and you say, hey, ransomware is bad. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you can say to somebody, we keep your patient information secure so that your patient information doesn't get out there so that people don't find out about your patient, that, that, that's more personal, right? Now it's not just about ransomware out there in, in the middle of something. It's really about their patients at this point. And like you say, their brand and what people are going to say about them and, and even how they can get not just cybersecurity insurance, but also be able to charge insurance companies for their work in that case, right? Yeah. And the impact on the brand, I think, isn't thought about enough here because almost every single MSP I talk to, their leads are coming from word of mouth and referrals. But yeah. really what we've learned over the years is when you get a lead coming from a referral, they're still going to Google you first before they reach out. And, and the first thing that they're going to see when they Google you is your Google reviews. 
Um, and you know, and if there's a recent like security incident in your Google reviews, like that is really like a, a catastrophic sort of thing. And it could uh, prevent this lead, which would otherwise be very strong from reaching out. If you look at the pros and the cons from the person searching you from their perspective, like the pro is, okay, they've had this referral, which makes you come across as credible. But then the the con of having a recent security incident with one of your clients and, and coming across that in a Google review would outweigh that pro. It really is a, a very important factor. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I like you you were talking about and that we talk about is getting that. And what Jeff was talking about now, you got to get really focused. And, and so what when you get really focused in a niche, when you get really focused in an avatar, even if you have an incident, you've got protocol for mitigating and managing that incident. And when you've got protocol for mitigating and managing that incident, you might have a Google review that says, hey, we had a breach and this right. is what these guys did. These guys that saved remediated, they <laughs> saved our ass, they remediated the breach. The problem is that when you're across a bunch of different verticals and you have different compliance and different things that you have to deal with and everything is different and you're small, it just makes it so hard, right? And so I, I know that I'm the guy that's always, oh, you got a niche, you got a niche. But there's a reason for that. It's not about the marketing. Everybody thinks that it's about the marketing, but it's not just about the marketing. The marketing is key because as we all know, right, it's easier to communicate when you're communicating to that ideal person that has the problem that you solve. But it's also about the delivery and being able to have protocols to mitigate this kind of risk which is only getting bigger and bigger every month that passes. I'd like to bring us back to the marketing though. So I appreciate this. Well, that's, that's but that's, that's what I was going to, what I was going to ask to you, Devin, is like, how do they then focus that messaging and thinking about the whole, the cycle all the way through, right? So what are some of the things that, that MSPs need to do as they're marketing toward this threat response? How do they think about it? Or marketing, whatever they're marketing. In terms of MSPs marketing, what, what do they need? When you see them, behind this question is we get a lot of MSPs who spent tens of thousands of dollars on marketing and they get zero benefit from it, right? And I know that you've seen that as well. And I know that you don't have that experience with most of with your clients. And so I'm curious how, how you go about understanding them and helping them get out there and market themselves with, without these massive fees that lead to nothing. Sure. So, you know, one of the, the tricky things about MSP marketing is there isn't one specific tactic that works um, and, and was going to get you leads in the door right away. It really is uh, multiple uh, factors contributing to a marketing mix. But the first one, obviously, is having a, a, a good website. Um, and it doesn't have to be the most beautiful website in the world. It doesn't have to be super fancy but have things on there that like content and elements of social proof. So mm. testimonials, video testimonials are great because I know a lot of MSPs struggle to, uh, they, they don't want to publish their client names because um, going back to the ransomware, if you have client names on your website, it could make them targets for ransomware. But if you have a video testimonial and you anonymize it, it's much more credible than like a written testimonial that's anonymized. Th that's really a, a big factor. And the case studies as well are a big thing for social proof on your website. And that is where, again, with the ransomware, you can have a case study about how you mitigated the, the ransomware and for a specific industry. That That's great content. And the nice thing about publishing case studies on your website too is you can utilize them for email marketing. I see a lot of MSPs who are one and done with leads. If they get a lead from their website or a trade show or whatever, they don't really have any sort of process in for following up with them on a consistent basis. And the whole nurturing cycle for MSPs is so important because it's really hard to get a client unless there's some sort of situation they find themselves in where it is like a data breach or, an, or a security incident or whatever. So the timing of actually reaching out to a new client is so important. And if you're not nurturing them, then you're just not going to be in front of them at the right time. So there's long sales cycles with MSPs. So Having that nurturing process in place too is really important, but of course you don't want to be sending out emails that don't have a lot of value. So having good content with case studies and, and white papers and things like security checklists that you can send out, that goes a long way to maximizing the amount of value that you're going to get from your leads. So you're not just that uh, one and done sort of an MSP. 
Yeah, I think that one and done thing is a huge issue. We find that so often that, that actually the problem that people face in marketing is actually has less to do with getting that initial contact and has more to do with just not following up with people, right? And not having that nurturing and not going in the the direction of like long-term engagement. I think we get stuck on advertising and sexy things that, that like you said, tactics that seem to work well. And, and really it's just kind of, fundamentals you're having a conversation with people have that conversation and have it over time don't just have one yeah. and be done with it right yeah i think what one of the things that that msps often forget is that you have to build trust right you have to build trust with that client they have to get to know you a little bit right so in, in when you're looking at that devin what is what does good content look like how do I engage that that uh, that that prospect over time? What does that look like? So I, I I'm part of the challenge here, which goes into the, the challenge of creating good content too, is a lot of MSPs are putting out the same stuff. It's similar content about a similar set of services. And everybody these days, especially in IT services, they get overwhelmed with so many different marketing messages that it's really difficult to stand out. Mm. And so going back to this idea of an avatar, have content that actually resonates with a particular industry and the challenges that they face. Mm. And it doesn't have to be like earth shattering stuff because it just has to be like relevant to them and it has to add value. It's obviously okay when you're doing email marketing and everything to be promotional. That's the entire reason why we're doing this. We're not doing this to make friends. We're doing it to make money. But at the same time, so I guess you want to have a call to action. Like most often it's to ask for a phone call or, or something like that. But you also want to make sure that in that same promotional message, there is a, a value add and not to be scared of giving away a little bit of your secret sauce, a little bit of your approach, because Realistically, your clients either don't have the time or don't have the expertise to implement what you're talking about anyway. So add the value and don't be scared about that. And then if they like what they hear and it speaks to their challenges in their particular industry and their particular job, then they're going to reach out. Yeah. So many people are so afraid of giving away the quote secret sauce. And it just, it doesn't matter how much you give away. People don't have the time or the inclination to do it. And it's, it's a desire. IT front. Because I promise you, I, for some reason, MSPs think that their customers are interested in IT. So they tend to talk a lot about IT and tech, right? But what we've learned is that the entire reason they're hiring you is because they don't care about IT. So stop talking about IT. Stop about what it means to your avatar and what your avatar needs. So I, yeah, I think we'd pretty much agree with it being around your avatar. So it's good to hear that as well. And I also found you're on LinkedIn, you've got a pretty cool matrix with, so the next thing that comes to mind is like this idea of paid advertising. And that comes up a lot. Like when do I do paid advertising? And I found this matrix on your LinkedIn. That's actually pretty interesting where you say, look, if you have low volume and low website engagement, then really focus on your content. And it's not until you have a lot of engagement that you even think about advertising, right? Yeah. So, so it's, and and then if you're getting, and, and then once you cross that threshold and you're getting lots of uh, users, you, you have it over over a thousand users, then you go back and worry more about the, the user experience. But, but at first in that one quadrant, it's just all about content, right? Yeah, exactly. Because the, the way I look at it is if, if you're not converting the traffic that you're getting organically already, then why would you pay money to send more traffic to your site? Because advertising for MSPs is really expensive. And yeah, love it. like Google ads, for instance, and by the way, Google ads, I'm, I'm not saying that it's, it's not a, a, a good tactic for a lot of MSPs. It, it is. Nice thing about Google ads is you can reach people when they're searching out when they actually have a problem. So you have good relevancy for the traffic, but it's expensive, especially if you live in a major metropolitan area, you could be paying $20, $25 or more per click to your website. Um, unless you're converting that traffic at a really good clip, there's just no way that you're going to uh, have an ROI on that. 
with there's a there's a couple exceptions, but I'll, I'll get into those as well. But for the most part, you don't want to be spending that money on sending people to your site unless it's already converting organically. And how do you get people to convert organically? It's the basics. It's probably the things that the listeners have heard before. So it's have good quality content in your site where people are searching for relevant searches. They're, they're going to pop up. It's yeah. having good conversion optimization on the site. Make it easy to find your, your contact page and convert. Have that social proof that we talked about earlier so you, you can stand out and come across credibly who visit the site, or for, credibly to people who visit the site. Um, and, and all the kind of the, the, the things that are, are standard, but... So many MSPs are not doing that. Um, and there are a couple exceptions for, for advertising though. We, we always like to recommend that MSPs bid on their own branded keywords. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but because some people will think, well, why would I bid on my own branded keywords? Cause I'm probably popping up in Google a number one result for those anyway, but there's a couple compelling reasons. First of all, it's to keep your competitors at bay. So if your competitors are bidding on your own keyword, on your own like branded keywords, they're going to show up before you on Google. So that's not good. And the other thing too, is there's research to show that it actually increases the conversion rate for people who are searching out uh, your, your company oh, right. and, and it makes the MSP come across more sophisticated, maybe makes them come across larger than they actually are when they have Google ads set up. So that's one. And it doesn't tend to be a big spend because let's face it, most MSPs don't have a ton of people searching for their brand name or their website, but it is, it's a small thing. And the other thing is just website retargeting Google. These days they don't use cookies, but the idea is still the same where they, they track somebody who visits your website and then they can serve ads to them as they go to other websites in the Google network. That's low hanging fruit. When people visit your website, they're already, you can assume they're already somewhat familiar with your company and with your brand and what you offer. So re-engaging with them again is, is a good idea. Uh, but besides that, we don't really recommend for most MSPs to be bidding on things like managed ID, uh, security consulting, IT consulting, like those keywords are just too expensive for there to be an ROI. Yeah. So what does good conversion optimization look like? What is, if you're really like at it, what does it look like? So it's having forms on your website that are easy to fill out. It, it's having call to actions on like the inner pages of your site mm. that leads your contact form or have a contact form right on those pages at the bottom. And so it, again, it's not like earth shattering things, but there's so many MSPs that make it too difficult to reach out. And I, I don't get that. Like no phone number, <laughs> no forms, no nothing. So what do you have to say to those guys? <laughs> my, my favorite is the guys who are like, we're your local MSP. And then they don't have their address on the website. So you don't know local to where. <laughs> yeah. And what we say to those people is uh, we can add a lot of value really quickly. So let's start working together. Cause like, yeah, like, I love that, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and, and the other thing too, is like having search terms uh, on your website that maybe don't have, so, so I should say targeting search terms on your website that maybe don't have a great deal of search volume, but are highly relevant is also a good idea. And that, cause that traffic converts to a really high clip. Obviously a lot of MSPs target themselves geographically, but having a page on your website that also references not only geographic terms, but like an industry term too. We're based in Vancouver. So if we were an MSP in Vancouver, maybe we have a page on our site specifically for, let's say law firms in Vancouver or, or dentists in Vancouver. And then, so anytime someone searches for T services for dental offices in Vancouver, you're going to pop up number one, and that might not be a lot of people, but that lead who reaches out is going to be so high quality. Yeah. So th that's another way to increase the conversion rate is just making sure that you're smart with your SEO and specific. So, so one, one of the things that it sounds like you're talking about here is you have to think about that customer journey itself. And I see a lot of MSPs with a lot of websites, with a lot of forms. Sometimes they got 10 forms. They got a form on every page. They got a form on every blog post, but there's no journey. Mm -hmm. So every, all the content is different, is disparate and is plain. So I think that there's two aspects to it, right? You have to think about the journey itself. How do you get the person to actually want to fill out the form? <laughs> and you have to have the form. If you don't have those two things, then you're in trouble. Yeah. And also with the customer journey, following up on that lead quickly. That's another thing I see MSP struggling with is quite often, and other IT service providers, they might not respond for two or three days to a lead coming in. Yeah. Well, you can probably assume if they reached out to you, 
They probably reached out to a couple other MSPs as well in their area. Yeah, they're they're doing the due diligence. They're finding multiple options, right? You you might have already lost out on that that um, that lead by because they've been you know inclined to go with somebody else they've already spoken to. So responding yeah. quickly is really crucial. Responding quickly to those leads, and then we also find we find quick response throughout the process to be so key because it's that response to a lead and then response to a proposal and MSPs. And not just MSPs, really. Lots of companies have a tendency to just put things off and, and I'm busy, so it takes a long time and then it doesn't get done and that, and that can be um, a, a real issue. And I think you said something that's really important a little bit earlier as well. You talked about, hey, you, you may only be ranking for dentists in, in Vancouver. One of the things that we find is everybody's looking for, where, where can I find 10,000 people to talk to? When really... They only need a couple of dozen to to get that critical mass to build your MSP. So there are probably plenty of dentists, accountants, lawyers, street vendors, I don't know, whatever industry you want in Vancouver for you to build a business around them yeah. and you can take it anywhere else. So I think that's a that's a crucial point. But I wanted to end with the last thing. Like you've got a really cool... SEO audit on your website. So we'll put uh, a link to that SEO audit. That's how people get started with you, right? Yeah, it's an offering that we have out there. If there's any listeners who want to get uh, the lay of the land for how their website is uh, in terms of technical SEO, and if there's any hindrances that might uh, prevent Google from from showing your website up in, in relevant searches, we can look at that and also look at your backlink profile and see how you're stacking up and uh, there as well. So yeah, would ha be happy to to go through that with anybody who would like to see how their website is stacking up with SEO currently. Yeah, that's awesome. So we'll have that link in the show notes. And I think when we talk about SEO, people talk about the fact that it takes time and it's hard and, it, and it's like fundamentals instead of going out and getting an ad and somebody coming and me getting a, a, a customer tomorrow. But I think that's the reality of it. It takes a little bit of time. It's back to that content. You have to have good content. If you have good content and you set it up technically well, you should be able to rank for some of these things. You should be able to stand out. You should be able to get some traffic and some conversions. And it'll take a little while. But once you have that and it's solid back to your two by two matrix, once you have something there, that core, then you can drive ads, then you can expand it, then you can go into other directions, but you really have to have that core. So I actually think that your SEO audit is a brilliant place to start. I think anybody listening to this should take you up on that and really understand where their SEO is. I, I think there's more opportunity in SEO than people appreciate. And I think that's a really valuable offer. So anybody who is, you're marketing an MSP, you're wondering where the customers are, how you can enhance that journey, how you can attract them more effectively, then go check this out. Have a chat with Devin about your SEO. I'm sure he'll give you some great advice and, and a good path forward. And on that, Devin, it's been a pleasure. Anything, any parting words of advice for, for MSPs and what they should be doing? Any thoughts to anybody out there struggling with marketing who's hearing this now and you think, ah, I wish they just knew that one thing. Any thoughts? I would say the biggest thing is there's no silver bullet of MSP marketing. It really is about doing a bunch of things uh, well, and then you'll start seeing a cumulative effect where if you're doing uh, all the little things, it will start adding up into good lead generation. You'll start converting those leads. So stick with it. It does take a little bit of time to build it up, mm. but if you have a good website, good SEO, good referrals, good social proof, it doesn't have to be the best in, in the world, but just be solid in all those aspects and you'll start to see results. Yeah, I think that sounds great. And from some of the websites that we see out there, it really doesn't take all that much. It's just getting the fundamentals right. Go check out the, the free SEO audit. Have a chat with Devin. And like I said, it's been a real pleasure having you here. Thanks for joining us. Joe, any last words? Just remember that you are loved. See y'all soon. Thanks for joining us. And a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one right now and tap into our insights and instincts to help drive your business vision and success. Remember, you didn't start your business to feel frustration. You started it for freedom. We can help you discover the impact, freedom, and wealth you always imagined. Learn more at startgrowmanage.com slash learn more.